First, the law of God is a reminder. Listen, this is a very simple thought, but it's a very profound. The law of God is a reminder that we are free. Because slaves cannot obey the commandments. Only people that are free. Only people that God had delivered can obey the commandments. No slaves. All right? So keep that in mind. All right. So the commandment goes like this. You or thou, right, shall have no other gods before me. Remember that I always, you know, try to get into the meanings of words to expand the understanding. The word have is the Hebrew, well, we're going to deal with the uh, word have and gods. The word have is the Hebrew word hayach. Okay, hayach. That's right. Exactly like that. Hayach. And that word is the word that can be translated as be or become or to exist, okay? The word gods, it's the word, you want to guess? Is the word Elohim. This word really, it, it appears in the Bible more than 2,000 times, 2,601 times, appears in the whole uh, Old Testament. And this Hebrew word is usually used in the context of the creator of heaven and earth. So Elohim is the meaning for, for God. Is the same word that is, is, is used when the Bible refers to God. So, I don't know if you're, you know, if you're looking for, to what I'm seeing here, but I'm just going to put it in a form that you might understand it better. The same commandment could be read, You shall, that's right, You shall no be other God before me. Have you thought about that? The same commandment is telling us, You shall no be other Elohim. You shall not be other God. The first commandment in the sequence of the commandment says, You shall not be other God. That should remind us of something that happened on the very beginning. You remember? The Bible says that the serpent came to the woman, Eve, to deceive. And you know what, what kind of deception she used? She said, For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be. You shall be as Elohim. So I want you to notice that really this is a contradiction of the commandment of God. God said, you shall not be other Elohim. And the serpent says, well, forget about what God says. I tell you, you shall be as Elohim. See, so when God is giving the commandments, he is pointing people back to the core problem of sin. He's telling them, this is the reason why you guys have gone through tribulation, through slavery, through problems. Because in the beginning, there were some people that broke this commandment. That broke this commandment. All right? So God is pointing the Israelites to the core problem of sin. So first step to keep our freedom. First step to keep our freedom is to avoid the attempt to become other God. Okay? The first step to avoid slavery is to understand that you're not God. Now, how many of you understand that you're not God? <laughs> See, I, I'm pretty sure that if I ask this on every single church, Adventist church or any other Christian church, if I ask the same question, everyone was going to say, I'm not God and I understand that I'm not God. But you know really what the definition of sin is. The definition of sin is really the attempt to become other God. So guess what? When we commit sin, we are attempting to do what we say we don't believe. It's attempting to, to become like God. Every sin we commit shows that we believe what the serpent said in the beginning. Right. A sin is going away from the strict will of God, from the commandments of God. So when we sin, we tell God, we don't need you. I can be God. I don't need you, God. I can be God. Now, let me ask you a very rhetorical question. You know what a rhetorical question is? You know, a rhetorical question is like a very, a question that is very, that has a very obvious answer. Okay? It's kind of self-understood when I ask the question. 
Why does God prohibit to be uh, prohibit us to be another God? Or why does He prohibit the world or the universe to have another God? Could it be because He's very jealous? Could it be because He doesn't want other person to be on His place? Could it be because He wants all the praise, all the glory, all the honor? What do you think? Why do you think that God is prohibiting to be other God? There you go. This is the very answer. Only God is God. I mean, that is very self-explanatory, right? Only God can be God. Is, is that clear enough? Is that very simple to understand? Well, believe it or not, believe it or not, this is the reason why this world has come to destruction. Believe it or not, this is the very reason why we suffer why we struggle, why we go into tribulations, is because there are some of us. No, let me say it this way. The world has not understood what I just asked you. The world has not understood that there is only one God, and that only God can be God. See, the answer is right here. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The question is, who is the subject? Me. Who's the subject? Me. Oh, who, is, who is this uh, me referring to? To God, right? So let me put it in a different way. The Bible is saying, Thou shalt have no other God before God. And the answer is, is what David just said. You cannot be other God because there is, only, there is only one God. Now, this is the same question that Moses asked when God sent him to deliver the Israelites. You remember that Moses was you know, wondering how he was going to deliver the people of Israel because he said, if I go to them and I tell them that you sent me, who am I going to tell them that he's sending me? Let me read it to you. He says, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God, Elohim, of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? See, Moses is saying, what am I going to tell them? I mean, which God is sending me? Do you remember what, what is the answer? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. You know what word is this? Hayah. God is saying, I am God. Why are you asking me which God? There's only one God. I am the one that I am. And he said, Thus shall say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. See, God is God. God doesn't need to make a distinction about who he is. Because he is God. There is no other God. You know, what a very simple commandment, right? But we break it because we don't understand it. We break it because we don't understand it. Now, let me go into another area. The Bible says, Thou shalt not be other God before God. See, the reason why you cannot be another God before God is because God is before everything else. You get that? The, the, the reason why you cannot be a God before God is because there is nothing before God. God is in the beginning. God is the beginning, God is the end. The Bible says, in the beginning, Elohim. God is saying, I am before anyone else in here. I am before everyone, therefore I am God. See, so the commandment is not a prohibition, if you want to say it this way. The commandment is rather, is rather a statement of the nature of God. God is basically establishing who He is. He's saying, I am God, therefore, there cannot be other God. He's just, he's not God by position, but by nature. There was not a decree in the time, you know, in, in the beginning that says, you know, I am, I'm, I, you know, before everyone says, well, you know, I have decided that I'm going to be God. So I hope you accept it. No, God is God because he was there in the beginning. Want to say something, Jaden? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. If everyone, um, because of the God, right. that means everyone would have a different definition of truth. 
There you go. That's right. There you go. So I, I, I thank you for, for bringing that up. This is the very reason why God doesn't allow you to think you can be God. Because then, if you're God, then you can make your definition of truth. Thank you so much. All right. Isaiah chapter 43 tells us again. It says, You are my witness, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know it and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God. Before... Uh, before, neither shall there be after me. Okay? Now, the word before not only implies that God is before in a chronological order. The word before also implies that God wants to be ahead of us. Let me show it to you with the, with the next verse. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight on your behalf just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. So you see what I'm trying to say? God is not saying, you know, I'm just, I was just the first, but he's saying, I am first, therefore I need to go before you. I need to go ahead of you. I need to go first. See, seek ye first the kingdom of God. God is just establishing the natural order of things. He's saying, I am first, and if you follow the natural sequence of things, then everything will be all right. God is saying, I'm going before you, and in the same way that I destroy or that I uh, defeated the Egyptians, remember, Egypt is a, is a symbol of what? Of sin. It says, the same way that I defeated sin in the past is the same way that I'm going to defeat sin in the future. The only thing you have to do is to let me go first, before. There you go. The Deuteronomy. 132 says, The Lord your God who goes before you on your way to seek out a place for you to encamp in fire by night and cloud day to what? Show you the way in which you should go. See the reason why God wants to be before? It's because we don't know which way to go. We don't have an understanding of where, you know, which way we should walk on. God says, you need to let me go first. Because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's right. See, it becomes more uh, meaningful when we read what Jesus says when, when we, once we have this background. This is Jesus himself says, I said, there, I said therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am. You know which word is this? <laughs> it's not the word Elohim. It's the word Ami, which translated in Hebrew is the word Hayah. Jesus is presenting himself as the first, as the beginning of everything. It is, I am first. I am the beginning. I am God. I was before you. Therefore, if you don't understand this, you will perish on your sins. Revelation 14.4 speak to us about the redeemed that live in the time of the end. These are called the 144,000. I believe a symbolic number of those that will be redeemed. Now, notice what the Bible says about these redeemed. It says, These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which what? Follow the Lamb. Now, if they follow the Lamb, in what position the, the Lamb goes? The Lamb goes first. See, these are the redeemed because they understood the first commandment. They understood that God goes before them. They understood that God needs to be placed in the first place. They understood and they obeyed the first commandment. They follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Okay? Now, you know the story of the wise men and the foolish men, right? There are songs that children sing all the time. The wise men and the foolish men. The story is very simple. They both built a house, right? The, the, the scripture doesn't really give us a description of the houses. But the Bible tells us that once they built their houses, the winds came and the storms and the struggles and the battles 
and the floods and everything. But there was something that made those houses different because one of those houses fell. But there was one house that stood in the middle of the storm. What was the difference? That's right. It was built upon what? Upon the rock. And who's the rock? Jesus Christ. So, let me just put it this way, okay? This is the, 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 this is the, 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 the verse. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house. And it, do, it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. So, I'm going to put it in words uh, that we can understand the, 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 what we're talking about. The wise man put the rock before his works. You get that? The reason why this house is standing, it doesn't depend on his works. It depends on where he put his works on. And he understood that the rock, that if you want to build, that the rock needs to go first. The rock needs to go before the house is built. In other words, the wise man put the rock first. So what is that the foolish man did? What did he put first? He put the house, right? The wise man, that's right. The foolish man put his works before. The foolish man didn't put the rock first. And if at any moment he wanted to add the rock, what was going to happen with the rock? He was going to crush it. See, the rock needs to go first. It's just the natural sequence of things. God is just presenting to, all, to us the natural sequence of things. Let me, let me uh, read it to you again. The, the Bible says, Thou shalt not have your works before me. That's what the commandment is saying. Thou shalt not have your works before me. Let me show you another example in creation. Creation and its order. You know that when you read chapter 1 of Genesis, there is a sequence, right? Uh, Water and light comes before plants. Plants come before animals. But before everything else, there is something that comes before this. What comes before all this? The land. You go back, you go back. You go back. You go back, back. You go back. That's right. <laughs> Genesis 1, 1 says... In the beginning, God, before all this, God is. See? And if you don't respect that order, then nothing can be sustained. See, imagine one day I would say, well, you know, I really want the plants before the water and before the light. What would happen with the plants? They would die. What if I say, well, no, I want to create the animals first because, you know, I just like the way that animals are. I want animals first. And then, and then I created, you know, the water and the light later when I have time. What's going to happen? That's right. They're not going to survive. They're going to die. See what is the problem then? See what is the key issue here? That if we don't put God first, what's going to happen? We're going to die. We're not following the sequence. We're not following the order of nature. God is God. We cannot change that. That is the way that things are done. All right. So God comes before everything. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Did you know that the word me is the word, you know, the Hebrew word panim, which can be translated as face. And it also can be translated as presence. So that's why there are some translations that actually says, Thou shalt have no other gods before my face. That's what they said. And there are other translations that says, Thou shalt have no other gods before my presence. Now, why is this so significant? Okay? You remember that the presence of God is located in the sanctuary, right? Where is God's presence located in the sanctuary? Now, you might think, well, it is in the most holy place, right? Well, let me show you something. Remember that God's throne is movable, right? And the Bible actually tells us where God's presence is. 
I want to show you the, 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 the following verse. Revelation 4, 2 and 5 tells us, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. So this is happening where? In heaven. And there is a throne. And then he says, And one sat on the throne. Who's this one? It's God. So God is sitting in this throne. So that means that the presence of God is there, whatever that place is, heaven, right? And it says, And out of the throne proceeding lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning where? Before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So let me show you. You have the sanctuary right here, right? This is the, the, this is the, the sanctuary where sin was forgiven, was atoned. And then you have the seven branch candlestick, which are the seven lamps that are burning before what? The seven lamps are burning before what? Before the throne. Thank you, Stefan. The seven lamps are burning before the throne. So what is before the throne? I mean, sorry, what is before the seven lamps? The throne, right. But in the, in the, in the sanctuary, what is, what is before those, the, the seven lamps? The table of the showbread. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but actually the Bible is telling us that the throne of God is the table of the showbread. And remember what, the, what, what, what Daniel said also. That throne was set in there. You know, the throne of God moves. So at some point, the throne of God comes into this place. The table of the show bread. Okay? Now, if the presence of God, you know, this is the table of the presence. That's what the table of show bread means. It means the table of the presence. So if the table is the throne of God because God's presence is there, where do you think that Satan began his attempt to become God? Where? That's right. At the table of the presence. He wanted to be God before God. He wanted to be God in the presence of God. Now, we have Satan, right? And this is what the Bible tells us about Satan. Isaiah 14, 13. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt what? My throne. Where do you think that Satan wants to establish his throne? Where? In the table of the showbread. Right? Because that's where the presence is. He says, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mouth of the congregation. On the mount of the congregation. Where is the mount of the congregation located? On the farthest side of the north. Let me just, let me just go back. So according to the Bible, the table of the showbread is where? On the north side. On the north side. And the Bible also tells us that the mount of the congregation is on the north side. You know what a congregation is, right? What a congregation is? It's a group. Give me another word for congregation. A church. See, the church of God is located on the north side of the sanctuary. That's what's called Mount Zion. On the farthest sides of the north. The table of the showbread is where God's throne sets not all the time. Not all the time. But we're going to show you later when the throne is set. Okay? So, if we put all these pieces together, what Satan wanted to do is to sit upon the congregation. Satan wanted to sit upon the congregation of God, upon the church of God. And you know what is the meaning of that sitting? Satan wanted to rule the congregation. He wanted to be another God before God, which is impossible. 
You cannot be God before God. God is pointing the Israelites and everyone that reads those commandments to the, to the conflict that began not only on earth, but actually began on heaven. See, all this controversy began because Lucifer decided that the commandment, thou shalt not be another God before him, does not apply for him. He says, I am a creature, but I'm, I do not agree with the idea of being a creature. I want to be God. I mean, nobody asked me. Nobody asked me to be a creature. Why didn't he give me the option to be, to be God? God, I, I don't agree with the way that you're dealing with things. You just want the praise and the honor and the glory. Let me be God, and you will know really what happiness means. I do not agree with, with your decisions. I do not agree with the way that I was born. I do not agree with the family that you put me in. I do not agree that I, that, that I was born with this disability. I do not agree that I'm going through these problems. You see, all these things repeated over and over, they, they began in heaven. They were discontent of how God deal with things and with nature itself. Notice what Hebrews 12, 22, 23 says, But you are come unto Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. So Mount Zion is also the heavenly Jerusalem. And the innumerable company of angels to the general assembly, the congregation and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Okay? So if the purpose of, or the desire of Satan wanted to sit in the congregation of heaven, what do you think is the, is the desire of Satan now? is to seat, is to lead the congregation again. So he wants to be the God of this congregation. He wants to be in the place of God. And he wants to sit over you, over your family, over your life. He wants to dominate your life. He wants to sit over the congregation. See, Satan wants to sit on where? On the table. On the table. Isn't that very significant? Satan wants to sit on the table. Let me, let me show you something that I think is very fascinating about the table of the, of the show bread. God actually promised to you and me that those that overcome will be able to sit with him. You know where? At the table of the show bread. Let me show it to you. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and opens the door, I will come unto him. And what is he going to do? Stop with him and he with me. Where do you stop with a person? At the table. That's right. At the table. And actually God tells us what the table is. He says, To him that overcome it will I grant to sit with me in my table. In my table. Even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his in his table. Jesus is sitting with his father in the table. And he says, if you overcome, you're also going to sit with me on the table. Notice what he said to the disciples. And I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my father bestow one upon me, that you may eat and drink at, at my table, in my kingdom. And sit on what? On thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Let me just give you another one. You know the, ta the table of the, of the show bread? You know, who is the bread of life? Jesus is the bread of life. But these, these loaves of bread were 12 breads. What do they represent, those 12 breads? The 12 tribes, which is you and me. You and me are represented in those 12 bread. So how, how come Jesus is the bread, but then we are also the bread? Let me tell you, this is pointing us to the end result of victory. Those that overcome will reflect the bread of life. That means that those breads, they look like their father. Their father is the bread of life. And what are they? What are they? They're little breads. 
little breads. They behave like him. They do the same things that he does. Those little breads, they're, they're my children. I am the bread of life. They're my little breads. Now, let me tell you something very interesting. You remember that I told you that this, this, this throne was set there. That means that that throne is not always there, but it's set in there. Do you know that actually that bread, that bread was replaced every Sabbath? That bread was placed every Sabbath. The priest will come with new bread and will bring it before the presence, before the table. Okay? Why is this so significant? The promise is this, family. The promise is this. Isaiah 63, 23. And it shall come to pass from month to month and from Sabbath to Sabbath that all flesh shall come to worship where? Before me. Before the throne. Before the presence of God in Jerusalem, saith the Lord. Now, you want to know the most exciting part of all this is that you don't have to wait till that time. Let me show it to you in a more explicit form. Okay? How many times do you come to church in a week? <laughs> you come twice. You come on Wednesday and when, when else? That's right. Oh, Tuesday, I'm sorry. Yeah. Tuesday for this church. And then you come also when? Right. So from month to month and from Sabbath to Sabbath, you come where? You come before the Lord. And you know what you do? You come and then you sit. You know why? Because you're going to start the feast. You're going to start eating the bread that God is providing for you in the table. See, that promise is not a future promise. That promise is for you and me, to those that accept to sit with Jesus Christ in the table of the showbread, to eat. Do you know that in the table of the showbread, actually they had spoons and plates? You know why? Because that was the place to break the, the bread, to give the bread. You know what we're going to do in that table of showbread in heaven? We're going to be before the presence of God. You know what? You know for what? Uh, for what reason? To sit in the throne of God, to eat the bread of God, the supper of God. Family, this is, this is very exciting. I hope, you know, I wish I could, I could portray my English better. And, and make you excited as this, you know, as it's giving me that, that is strength. Yes, brother. Isaiah 63, 22 and 22. Okay, 20, 22. Okay, thank you. There you go. Okay. I hope that it could, you know, this could bring the excitement that it brought to my heart. Uh, like I said, sometimes words cannot express really the joy that these things bring to the mind of those that read them. Right? Only those that eat the bread can experience that joy. No one can eat the bread for you, right? You go, you go into the pot, pot lot and it says, well, you can eat for me. It doesn't work, right? You got to eat the bread by yourself. You got to feel the joy by yourself. That bread only can be eaten by you, right? No one else can eat it by you. So I hope this can Help us understand the beautiful, beautiful message that God has for us. Prepare every Sabbath. This experience is going to be repeated for eternity. From month to month and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come before me, saith the Lord.